Thanks for coming to the second masterclass. This one is about making site-specific productions. At Theatre Rights, we've made a number of different site-specific productions and not one of the processes has been the same. So how do you talk about the process of making this sort of work? Well, I thought I'd have a go by applying my puppet whispering technique to site-specific work and see if that helps me explain what I do. So when I talked in the first masterclass about puppet whispering, I talked about laying the puppet on the table or the object on the table and animating it using your external motor force. But of course you can't do that with a site or a space. You can't lay it on the table. So how do we animate it? How do we bring it to life so it can tell us its story? Well, I think about that as animating it from within, by being within it. I suppose you can think of a puppet like a glove puppet, for example, there. That's a, I never work with glove puppets, but that your hand is actually inside the object to bring it to life. I'll put a sensor there because that's a naked glove puppet. Anyway, um, how do we animate a space? Well, maybe you put an object into the space in order to help us see it differently. Or maybe we put a series of objects in that space. And I think about someone like the artist Joseph Cornell, who makes art in boxes. He puts a series of objects in the box in order for you to then make up your own narrative. I think this we can apply to larger spaces. We can move those objects in that space to animate it. Or we can put in people, dancers, performers, and they also I think of them as, as also animating the space rather than performing within it. So it's a slightly different way of thinking about it and it makes, it, it helps the performer remember that they are not performing on a stage, they're performing in a different space and therefore they must be sensitive to that. They must make the space look good and the space will make them look good. It's a win-win. And then lastly, which I think is probably the most important aspect of site-specific is how do we animate a space, a building, by putting an audience in it. Because the way we move them, that crowd of people, or maybe it's only three people, or maybe it's a thousand people, but whoever that group of people is, I think of them as a puppet. And I think, how do I animate that object, the people, so that they might be able to listen to the building with an integrity and hear its truths? When I am introduced to a space, the first visit is really important. I am often with a caretaker, someone who has the keys, who maybe knows about the history of the building, maybe not. Um, and I'm often with a producer who has also identified the building for me. And I might be with a member of the creative team, maybe the designer, not sure on a first visit. And when I first visit a site, I like to go in behind those other people. I like to go in behind them because I like to see what they do. I like to see if they turn right or left, whether there is a natural way of going through the building. And then that tells me what an audience is likely to want to do. Of course, we may, might be finding out that it's got a number of different entrances, but even then with each entrance, is there an urge to turn right or left or really is it very open? So I try to discover what a natural choreography in the space is. Then I think about if we want to go against it, I'm aware that what we're trying to do is lure the audience in a different direction and we will have to work harder to get them to turn a different way or to go back on themselves or to miss out on that bit. The other thing I'm looking at is how other people visiting with me how they're drawn to details. The first visit, I look at what I'm drawn to, but other times when I might revisit with a designer or with a sound designer or a composer, I'm thinking whether they are drawn to different parts of the building to me. And I collate 
all that information and I know the first or second visit it's all very new and I will probably forget that if I didn't write it down and I have to make a note of it I start up a journal for that particular site just making a note of all the things that it said to me immediately what you've probably noticed is that I haven't talked about asking about the history of the building and a lot of people are um, a bit like with the puppet whispering. They're like, oh, can you do this with it? Can you do that with it? Can you, do that? you need to know the facts. You need to do the task. But I'm interested in what the building was able to tell me before I knew its history. Because if you're making site-specific work for children, you cannot assume they will know the history of the building. They may not even be interested in the history of the building because it was before their existence. So that's all going to take a little bit more effort. So now I know if the building emanates its history or whether I need to tell it or whether it's not important at all, which sometimes is the case because it's just something other about the space that interests me. But of course, if the building has got history, usually second or third visit, that's absolutely when I want to hear about all that. The facts can start coming in and then that brings up another way of listening to the building. Another thing that happens when I'm visiting a space with a group of people is we naturally um, congregate somewhere to have a little reflection a little moment and I always think well that was we'd seen enough to be able to check in with each other so there was a certain amount sometimes the space is intense and we do that straight away sometimes we wander around and do that in after about 15 minutes and this tells me something about where the heart of the place is or where people feel like they can congregate and so I think this is an important thing to know so that you can put it in your show. I suppose what you do in, when you visit a space is sometimes you'll be finding out that there's a small cupboard or a small area that's fascinating and you love going in there. But of course, in about the second visit, you're going there with a health and safety expert and they will tell you no way are you going to take a lot of people in there because there aren't two exits for the audience to leave and no one wants to make an unsafe piece of work and there are some areas that are no go. So you have to decide to let go of that space or how can you let the audience go in there via some other method. Maybe you film in there and let people view inside. So there are ways of keeping spaces within your piece but not always. But you might find the essence of that cupboard space in a more open space. So already in those first two visits, you've found out about history, choreography of the space, and also the health and safety. But the choreography of the space must speak first because health and safety is about what you can't do. And history limits your imagination. It's only as the building has been used in the past. So I would say protect, protect how you listen to the building with your own feelings, your own heart, your own eyes, and how you move about. Then let those other voices enter. I do remember going around a heritage site, but on our very first visit, all we heard about was what we can't do. And of course it was important to hear about that, to hear that we mustn't damage the building. We weren't even allowed to take water in and we were gonna to have to think about that. Um, we certainly weren't allowed to drill or change anything. But the problem with hearing that in the first visit was that we left uninspired. And so really I would say try to visit on your own terms first and then welcome in those who are protecting the building. It's not always possible, but it's, it's an example that happened to us. And I do remember that. It's important to draft up a budget with your production manager um, using guesstimates, basically. But of course, once you've got that fixed amount, you can move the money around to suit the actual real circumstances. However, it's important to always have a contingency. 
and be aware that a very uh, big part of your budget will be spent on making the space safe or accessible. There was one we went into for cellar works where the first thing we had to do in a wonderful cellar was remove the asbestos. So that took quite a large amount of our budget, but it felt important to do that for the legacy of the building because it was going to, after our show, become artist studios. And so therefore removing the asbestos and putting electricity in properly was going to be something useful at a later stage. So even by doing three visits, you've already got so much information about this site. How do you edit that material and start to guide it towards show content? And how do I, as a director, lead the wider team that I've invited in to respond to this site with me? What's important is that I allow every collaborator the same experience as I've just explained. They need time in the site to listen to it in their way. Your sound designers will be telling you about the acoustics in the building and what's possible. But then I've got even more information about how to animate this site. So how do I start editing? Well, I think I can explain this again using my puppet whispering technique. And this is when puppet whispering becomes me talking to more than one person puppeteering a puppet. It's the Bunraku Japanese approach to three people operating one puppet. And if they all don't tune in with each other, the puppet just doesn't work. It doesn't come to life. It feels pulled about. So what I'm trying to do when I'm puppet whispering it is to help those three people all listen to the same object, to the same motivation that's coming from that object what it wants to do, as opposed to what those three people individually want to do. So this is what I do. This is how I use a site. For every idea that they have, I check whether it would end up shaking this building around and putting too much information in it, or whether all the different ideas for the different collaborators, where they meet, and this, the building becomes the glue. It becomes the script. It becomes the place where if everyone meets with an idea, that's the one that's going to get through. It's, it's, you know, some ideas disappear and they're great ideas. And they're what that artist might do with another group of artists. But we're looking at the connections of where we all got to and that those ideas connected together. And therefore, like puppet whispering, the puppet seems to take a life of its own. And I can feel the building starting to animate in the hands of those collaborators. I think I'd like to talk about one particular site-specific show that we made, um, which was called Hospital Works, making a site-specific in a hospital. We had a great deal of trouble finding the site. We had funding from the Wellcome Foundation and we had funding from Polka Theatre and we had our own theatre rights funding. So it wasn't about funding. It was about finding a hospital space that we could use. We looked at, I think, over 15 London hospital spaces and went down quite a few avenues with each one. And it took a long time to find the one that we were going to use. And I suppose what I learnt from that experience was perseverance pays off. Um, I was working at that stage with um, Natalie Highwood, who was the general manager. And at one point I just said, look, it's not going to work. We're not going to find a hospital that we can do this in that doesn't keep pulling out or has a problem with it. Um, it's fair enough. It's not possible. And she said, no, we're not giving up. We're going to do it. And then about two months later, she said, oh, I'm giving up. I can't do it. And I said, no, we're going to carry on. So what I learned from that is you need you need a good team, a good determined team to help you find a site or face the hurdles of site-specific work because that was just one hurdle you can face. Sites get changed. With houseworks, we were told we were going to have a house and then about six weeks before, that house was being knocked down. So we had to find another house 
and it changed everything we did. Other times we've had the site for two years and we've done lots of visits and it never changes and it's blissful. <laughs> so it just depends on the circumstance. But Hospital Works, in a way that looking for that site became part of the process, part of going, why can't we get a site in a hospital to work with? And it's because most of them are needed for another reason, <laughs> obviously. Or they don't know when they're going to be um, renovated and then that suddenly kicks into action or they can't make promises. But we really wanted to make a show about being in a hospital for children. We did eventually get a site and that was in Croydon. I was collaborating with David Haradine of Fever Sleep and the designer Sophia Clist. And we then started the process together. And our next hurdle became, well, who are the patients? We had about six performers in our team. And if they were to play all the patients, it would be really weird. Oh, I felt it would be weird. And we thought, hmm. So can the audience be patients? And I thought, well, you've got all these children who are visiting the hospital and it would be nice if they could feel well as opposed to playing sick children. So I didn't like the idea of that either. But then after, I think it was after about four months of brainstorming that we said, well, maybe the problem is the answer. Maybe it is that the, the hospital is sick and that it's the objects in the hospital that we have to make better. It allowed the performers to play doctors and nurses and it allowed the audience to visit and join in with that process of how to mend the hospital. And of course, it became so politically relevant, even at this time, which was a few years ago, that the NHS was struggling. So it became a beautiful metaphor that then led all the rest of the process. We looked at breathing beds that needed to be resuscitated. We looked at beds that were going to give birth to pillows. We looked at pillows that he did injecting. We went in and we uh, did x-rays of, of rooms. And the children were going in these rooms and listening to breathing beds. They even went in a room that had cracks all over the walls and they were given plasters to put over the cracks. It was a beautiful way of thinking about our NHS and allowing children to be in a hospital for a reason other than visiting someone who's ill or being ill themselves. So I suppose what I learned about that process was the problem is the answer. That happens in a lot of theatre processes, but it happens all the time in Site Specific. Because a Site Specific isn't a theatre, it isn't made to have a piece of theatre in it. It isn't ready for that. So there are a huge number of problems and you have to have a very, very good production manager and a really, really inventive team. A team that's willing to accept that their ideas don't necessarily help hold the glue of the building together or if their ideas might damage the building or they might put the audience at risk. I'd like to talk a bit more about how you animate a building by placing objects within the bigger object. Now, of course, this could be because when you go to see a site, there are already things there and you can use those objects that you find. With Houseworks, the designer, Stephen Williams, he just took everything we found in the house and in one room, he replaced those objects. He hung them from the ceiling, turned them upside down or had them appearing halfway out of the floor. Um, so that was the what we called the upside down room, the topsy-turvy room, which held all the objects that we had found on first visit. I think another really good example would be Millworks. Millworks was co-directed by Graham Miller, designed by Sophia Lovell-Smith, with sound design by Kate Tierney. It was commissioned by the Greenwich and Docklands Festival as a response to a mill 
that they had a heritage site and we weren't allowed to touch it in any way. And also adding to that, in between our shows was also a real guided tour. So we had to actually remove everything. So what we thought we would do is look at putting objects within the space so that we can take them away in between each show. So I looked at what objects would you find in a mill and tried to make the show content from listening to those objects. So of course we went to the metaphor of the milling process and we ended up making a show that was really about the life and death cycle. It started with a, um, the idea that the audience is coming to a tour, a normal tour of the building, but the ghosts of the building are speaking to us and the ghosts of the materials that might have been there. So they meet um, what we call the wheat figure. And I was inspired by uh, corn dollies and how figures were made out of corn and woven. And then the process of the show was the sacrifice of that wheat dolly who became wheat. And then that wheat went into sacks and we made puppets out of the sacks who sort of in a Punch and Judy style fought with each other of who had the most wheat inside them. And then that wheat was pounded to make flour. And we had a huge bag of flour that sort of rolled about in the corner. And then that flour was made into dough and the whole audience were asked to join two wacky chefs um, to knead the dough and chant a song while kneading the dough that we would then put in the oven it was then turned into a figure that was made out of bread, which was the same shape as the original wheat figure. And then the performers ate that. And the audience were given um, a role on their exit. And the whole thing was just about the cycle of life, the, the rotation of the material. And really, that was, that was everything we needed for that. We just needed to listen to the objects that you would naturally find in the site and bring them to life to tell the story. When I visit a site, I also immediately see whether it's wheelchair friendly. And this is because I spent quite a lot of my time in a wheelchair and there were a number of site specific shows that I wasn't able to visit for this reason. And I vowed that I would never ever produce one like that. Um, but it does cost and it does mean sometimes you are unable to use a site because it's full of stairs and there is no lift and you have to give up a beautiful site. But sometimes there are ways of looking at the choreography of the space that does allow you to use it and then that's exciting. I think it's essential. It is non-negotiable to make your work accessible. Throughout this masterclass, we'll be showing you images that show audiences moving about, um, sometimes using stairs. But please be assured that we always offered an alternate route to those people who were unable to use stairs. The other thing that I'm really, really keen on doing is making the work accessible to children. That was really how Theatre Rights was born, with Penny Bernand, the co-founder, and myself sitting on a settee discussing the fact that we would love to have put on a site-specific show that was like all the other ones that were being made at the time, but make it available for children. And we said, oh, wouldn't it be great to just take some under fives around a very ordinary house and bring it to life in a different way? And then a week later, we met Lyft and they said they were doing an out of lift, which was for specifically for children. They wanted to make site specific work and our idea was ideal. So that was the beginning of Houseworks and of Theatre Rights first site specific production. Maybe you're thinking you really like the idea of making site specific work, but allowing children into it, doesn't it mean you have to dumb down the politics? Doesn't it mean you have to think about health and safety in a different way? Doesn't it mean that you just can't do what you want to do as an artist? Well, if it meant all those things, I don't think I would be doing it if I couldn't discover those things. I have kept going back to including and not excluding children from my audience. So why have I done that? 
Now there's going to be a masterclass about generally why I feel making work for children is a valuable thing to do for the children and for the artists and for society. But that's another masterclass. But I want to talk about the things that are specific to the site specific work. So one of the challenges of making work for children and adults site specifically is that you have audiences of different heights. Well, I've already talked about the fact that you should be thinking about people who have different disabilities. So of course they may be um, on different levels of sight lines or be sight limited. So you're thinking about that anyway, if you introduce children into your work. If you want to change the perspective of how an audience is experiencing your work, what you have to remember is they can't just turn around. Suddenly what happens is that the big people are standing in the way. And these things can be really annoying because with a, with a group of able-bodied adults, you can just move them around easily. But I think you get more inventive when you think about different ways of enabling an audience to all see. And what happens is they start to tune in with each other as an audience and they start to become sensitive to each other's sight lines. And you get more inventive in how you reveal the work in the space, but also you start to build this sense of community in your audience, which I think is glorious, particularly if it's inclusive of all ages. might be thinking, well, what about the dark metaphors that sometimes these spaces has? I mean, we created a piece in a cellar. What do we do with those ideas? And I want to say that you can still have them. The process definitely needs to involve them because you will summon up all your adult feelings. And what I've found is that sometimes a building can echo those feelings, but because you're not using words, only the adults will pick up that and children won't pick up that, they'll interpret it on a different level from the level of their understanding. So because it's metaphorical and because it's not language-based, you can often allow some of those dark or political metaphors to be in the work. And it just makes the work richer, knowing that every single member in your audience is interpreting it on their own basis. And uh, that includes politics. It is political to put work on in different spaces. It is evocative of everything that's happened in this, that space before, whether you talk about it or not. So you are already doing that. It's just that children may not need to hear about that. So the adults experience it, but the children get a different experience. I'm reminded of when we made Bank On It. Bank On It was commissioned by the Barbican, Warwick Arts Centre and the Economics Department of Warwick University. It was designed by Hannah Clark and used a sort of super realism to it. In fact, it was so super real that um, some audience members walked past the uh, cash point machine that we used to open the show and thought it was a real one and tried to get money out of it. Um, but in fact, it was a prop in which it was the beginning of our story of the bank not allowing people to get money from it. A lot of my colleagues were saying, so you're going to make an angry show about banking because we'd had an economic crisis and we were really angry. And I, of course, I read about economics for a couple of years and I was furious. But I thought, if we're inviting children from five to ten years old into here, are they angry? No. Do they know about economics? Probably not much. The adults didn't know much about economics before this time. Um, did I want to make a piece about financial education? No. But what I did want to do is allow children to just 
think about what a bank is, to think about what economics is. And I was very inspired when the economics department of Warwick said economics is about everything except for God and love. It is about all our resources. So I wanted children to think about everything but God and love. But in the end, I think they thought about that too, because inviting young children into a building that was a pretend bank and taking them into a secret safe, which was really about the resources of the world that we're really protecting with money and allowing the children to go deeper into the bank and find the bank's own wishing fountain where they were given the last few pennies of the bank that existed and they were allowed to use it to make a wish and we collected some of their wishes to bank for the future and they were all about love they were all about their beliefs and they were all about taking care of the earth and of the people they loved so that really moved the adults that were with them. And so the adults arrived at this site-specific show feeling angry and expecting to hear another, like if they'd been to an adult show about economics, another one where, you know, they would whip themselves into feeling guilty and angry. Instead, they left feeling emotional. And I felt that was a real achievement um, in making a show about economics at that time. And that was because we included children in the audience. You might also think about why take children into a site because actually your health and safety officer is going to be really on your back because what you've got is a situation, unlike adults who might take care of themselves with uh, maybe some information, children, we are expected to take care of their safety. And the adults who are with them, the teachers, the carers, the parents, are super aware of that and need to know the rules. And so this might be more boring to somebody else who wants to just let audiences roam around a building, take it in in their own time. It doesn't work quite so well with families or teachers because they just need to know when they can allow the children to be free and explore and when they need to um, adhere to some rules just purely for the safety of the building or themselves. So that is much more part of the work. But again, I really like the fact that that builds up a trust in the audience, that we respect the adults in the audience, we respect their job as carers, and that we're saying, we will take care of you while you take care of your younger ones. We will allow you to move around the building together safely. And that's unlike asking them all to turn up at a theatre and sit down. It's, it's a bigger responsibility and you're asking more of those adults and therefore, I think you need to be their friends. Um, and that's where it's unlike um, maybe a punch drunk show where you um, are more expected to take care of yourself. You might be split up from your friends or you might find yourself missing out on one bit, but, uh, but finding yourself in another. And this, the adults that go are going there because they enjoy that um, confusion. I find that confusion needs to be earned in the work invo involving children and adults. But then I love the fact that we need to earn confusion. I love the fact that every show involving young people has to end with reparation because if you're an adult, you pay for the ticket, you, you pay to go to that site-specific production and you are, you are ready to have the experience. Children are often taken to it, they haven't chosen to, and children leave and they might not have the resources to manage the feelings you've conjured up in them. And therefore, you always leave them with some feeling of reparation, some space at the end of the experience which allows you to reflect and get what you need to be able to walk back out into the wider world. We need to find what's funny in a space. We need to help the audience slow down because children, even when you show them around a gallery, they're pretty fast and they will run through your space if there is space ahead of them. They're quicker. And what you have to do 
is find ways to slow them down, to make a sort of treasure hunt of it, or to remind them that they're looking for other sorts of clues, or that maybe things prevent them moving forward. And that reminds me of a sort of video game where they have to get from different levels. They have to earn the right to move into the next space. And that makes me think of Paradise. Paradise was a commission from the Ruhr Triennale in Germany. The installation artist was Jeremy Herbert, the composer Nick Powell, the choreographer Luca Silvestrini from Protein, and the lighting designer Anna Watson. And we were shown an industrial building, and it, it was on the heritage site for coal mining. And we had to work out how to use nine concrete chambers that all looked identical and were all used to sort coal. Finding the choreography of that space was, I thought we would let the audience go in and, and go in different chambers at different times and move them around. Maybe 10 in that one, 10 in that one. And then I took Nick, the composer, and he said, you do know that the, the, the echo in here is three seconds long and anything you play in any space will distort and be heard everywhere. And I thought, hmm, we could go with that. But what I really heard from him was it would be better if the audience had one linear experience. So that was on a first or second visit, we knew that the idea changed from being splitting the audience up to being a linear series. And then I thought, well, what way round are the nine chambers do we go? They're all identical. Well, they weren't completely identical when you looked really carefully, but they appeared identical. So Jeremy um, spent a lot of time talking about different installations he could do in the different rooms. One room we made rain inside. Another room had a cloud. Another room we were able to shoot light up through the floor through tiny holes to make a forest of light, which once we'd made that, Jeremy discovered that by putting a huge mirror made that expand even more and by lifting the mirror revealed the next space. So by working closely with Jeremy, the choreography of the space was revealed because which installation revealed the next one the best? Which way round should we move? Whilst that was also happening with the choreography of the space, we were also thinking of the theme that the festival had given us and it was the theme of religion. It's so huge. How do you make a show about religion that involves children in a space that's got nine chambers? So the answer to that was through casting. Casting is very important in site-specific work. In this instance, what I did was with the theatre rights team, I think we met probably about 150 people and we tried to cast different people who had experience of religion, whether they were still religious or they had were not following through their religious beliefs, but had been brought up with those religious beliefs. And we would have a, one example of each in our team of eight. That way I knew we were putting religion in the room from that person's perspective. And by playing together in the space and with those people, it would naturally be about religion without it having to be uh, an explanation about what their particular religion was about. It was a very different way of approaching a site specific. It was probably our most expensive and it, therefore it never moved anywhere else. So how long should you give yourself to make a site specific production? Well, I, I mean, I would usually say two years to really think through ideas, but really the, the, the site often has to come later in that period because um, it used to be possible that you could get a site two years in advance, but now with property meaning something very, very different, you often wouldn't get a site until six months before or four months before the event. Therefore, what you're doing is either waiting and preparing your team and waiting to respond to the site, or you're already deciding a theme 
and you prepare as much as you can and then you see what the metaphor is that the site brings. Um, so it depends on the order but in terms of building a team and thinking about ideas and connecting I would prefer two years and about six weeks on site to build and make sure it's safe for performers, for dancers, for puppeteers, to install sound equipment, to make sure the audience, you can bring an audience in, try it out, and then um, snag that of what happened if people couldn't see or people felt unsafe or there was cues. And that actually brings me to something about a lot of site-specific performances. They think about them as being the event in the space. And that is, of course, what it's about, but the transitions are as interesting. In order to go in the building or out of the building or to go in the building and move within the building, the time it takes an audience to move from one space to another is quite long. Um, so you need to think about what the front of the line are experiencing and what the back of the line are experiencing and what the middle section are experiencing. You often have to put experiences on a journey, install a space that's a journey space, um, or you put your performers throughout the group and make sure that no one's missing out anything. And of course, any story development can't be developed at that stage because they might miss something. So I think transitions are really, really interesting to look at and they're easily forgotten. So I almost look at transitions first and go, why are we moving from this space to another space? What, what calls us or what drives us out of a space into another it comes back to the choreography and then the journey becomes as interesting as the arriving somewhere. So often in a park for a firework display or a piece of outdoor theatre, um, you're standing for a long period of time looking up um, and that's just accepted. I like to think about people who maybe can't do that for grandparents or for someone who has a disability or for someone who just actually in order to watch something does like to have a seat. Um, so we do like to think about how long we ask an audience to move and when can they arrive in certain places and maybe have somewhere to sit down? Is the floor clean enough to sit down on? Can we provide seating? Do we need to provide rake seating? Actually, that for the welcoming party took a lot of thinking through because it was an hour and a half experience and we certainly didn't want to ask everyone to stand for that period of time. So it was fascinating to look at what they could sit on, what was allowed by our health and safety department to be seen as seats. You cannot have things lying on the floor that might be a trip hazard. So it's, it's one of the trickiest things to design. But when you do, you really nail it and it's exciting. So how can you tour site-specific productions? Well, of course, you can't tour them in the traditional sense of uh, like a theatre show going from one venue to another. But we have toured our site-specific shows. Houseworks was performed in Brixton in an ordinary house and then later on performed in Belfast. The thing about that show was because it was an ordinary site, you could find one in many different cities and therefore you can repeat it a number of times. We needed about um, a four week get in so that we could rehearse in one room while the installation was happening in another. Shopworks, we moved from London Tooting to Vienna and that was straight afterwards. So we did that and we decided to change the position of the audience. We had done the beginning of the show front on, watching the show. Um, and when we went to Vienna, we decided to make it more like a catwalk and, uh, and actually have the audience on both sides, just to keep it fresh and alive. The show I would like to talk about in more detail in order to discuss this idea of how do you transfer a site-specific production to another space um, is the welcoming party. 
The Welcoming Party was commissioned by Manchester International Festival, Z Arts Children's Theatre and also the Ruhr Triennale, designed by Simon Dore, lighting design Mark Doubleday, choreography Jamal Berkmer and composition Frank Noon. What's interesting about this production was that it involved us having to change the choreography of the space. But also it changed the metaphor of the space. And we had to change the casting because it happened a year later and had to be performed in German. So this is why this is a good example for me to talk about, to look at what sort of things you need to consider when trying to move a site-specific show. The Welcoming Party was originally proposed as a response to an industrial building in Germany, in Dinslaken, to reflect on the fact that they were at that time welcoming many refugees from Syria. The show got postponed because Germany was actually dealing with the realities of that. It was at that point that Manchester International Festival um, stepped forward and said, actually, it would be wonderful if you could do it in Manchester because um, at that time, Brexit was threatening, but also because the UK was not welcoming people, uh, particularly unaccompanied children. And therefore, it felt very important to create that show then. So we created two versions of this production. And I'm going to talk about the comparison between the two as a way of uh, explaining how we uh, transformed and adjusted the process. First of all, I want to let you know how the metaphor of the site had to change. And this uh, makes an enormous uh, difference to the way you present the show. In Manchester, we were given the 1830s warehouse building. This was built in order to receive the cargo from one of the first railways to move both people and goods. Therefore, the metaphor, uh, which was beautifully expressed by one of the actresses in the piece was, we are not cargo, we are human beings. Whereas in Dinslaken, the uh, space was uh, an industrial building used to fix the equipment for the coal mining industry. And therefore the metaphor became a reflection of the fact that Germany had welcomed many more refugees. And the message was, do not fix us or dismiss us. We are not broken. The biggest difference was in the casting. In Manchester, we had the delight of collaborating with performer and refugee Mohammed um, from Sudan. We were able to tell his story of his traumatic journey that he had just recently had using the aesthetic of the building site that was presented to us in the warehouse. Whereas when we were in Germany, we collaborated with another Mohammed, but from Syria because in Germany there were many, many more Syrian performers actually able to audition for us, whereas in the UK they hadn't even arrived or didn't have the right to remain or be employed. So once we were in Germany, we did work with a Syrian performer and we told his story, which was different geographically and emotionally, but we used similar objects and added some new ones. What we were able to do in each space was respond to a local refugee story and offer very needed employment to professional performers and perform it in both their own language and in the language that the audience would understand. For each production, the cast was selected based on their experience of being a refugee, either in the recently or in the past, or their family having experience of uh, being refugees. In the UK, we were also very lucky to meet Ahmed, who was able to share with us his story of being a child refugee who traveled from Iraq to Iran, to Syria, to Norway, and then to London, talking about his lost childhood. The difference for his story, because it was more in the past, was that he, unlike our two Mohammeds who were unable to take anything with them, Ahmed did have a whole selection of 
uh, photographs and references for his past. And so we decided to tell his story through a series of files using collage aesthetic and filming on the mobile phone. Ahmed's story was so beautifully imagined that we really wanted to find a way of taking it and putting it into the German production. But of course the problem was that Ahmed didn't speak German. So after long and considered conversations with him, he very generously gave us permission to employ a German Arabic speaking actor to be him and retell his story. The only thing he asked was that we, we remove specific references and photographic elements. In Manchester, we had also involved a very personal story by an actress called McCall. McCall reflected on her mother's experience of arriving as a migrant to the UK, leaving Nigeria to build a better future for her children. But the problem with that too was that she didn't speak German. So we came up with a different solution for this story. We took McCall with us as an assistant director. That way she could collaborate with me in redirecting her own story with an actress from Berlin and a musician, a refugee from Togo. What was able to happen was that McCall's story, which was already an interpretation of her family's experience, was then layered in with the experiences of these two new women. That way, the story became richer as it became able to hold the female experience across generations. I personally love moving site-specific productions. People think it's impossible. They'll see a show in one site and think, oh, you can't possibly do it somewhere else. But if you have time and if you have recreation opportunities, which may involve any number of approaches, it is a wonderful thing to do. A site takes on the history of a previous site and the stories mingle together and the piece becomes richer and richer. So I hope you've enjoyed um, listening to me talk about the various approaches, discoveries, hurdles that I've been through with theatre rights making site specific work and I hope it inspires you to think about making work outside of theatre buildings in your way. Thanks for listening. <laughs>